Hey guys, today we're starting a new series. It's going to be called OMG Tech and it's about tech which is outside of the norm of what the market demands or what companies should really make. But nevertheless, this tech is either going to be really, really cool or very disappointing. And we'll see as the series goes. Today, we're going to start off with Asus Ryzen 3 cooler. It's overbuilt and over-engineered. It's also probably a bit overpriced, but it's cool nevertheless. It's a water cooler and we have two versions of it. We have a 360mm and 240mm. So let's open them up and see what's inside, what you get for your money. And later on, we'll do proper benchmarking and provide you results in terms of is it just looks or is it actually performant as well. Let's open up the 360 and get into it. I believe these are the fans. Right, let's have a look. And if you look at it closely, it's missing something. It has no cables because they've gone the same way as Lin and Lee and they've made them connect to each other through these little pins on each side, which control both the speed as well as RGB. Uh, these are ARGB fans. Let me just quickly have a look. So, uh, first time actually using them. See how they connect. Oh, magnets. Love it. Uh, and it's, that is awesome. That is super pleasant. And if you try to connect it the other way around, it doesn't want to do it. You see, it doesn't align properly. So it actually holds really nicely. That is nice and solid and very satisfying. I don't know. I don't think I've been excited about fans as much before, but that is cool. All right, let's take the actual cooler out. So we've actually tested out Ryogen 2 previously. And one of our observations about it was that in marketing, Asus shows this beautiful uh, set. And once you assemble everything, there's just a gazillion amount of cables, which are actually really hard to cover because you've got the fan cables, you've got the RGB cables, and they all have to go to a separate hub. Uh, in this particular example, you don't need any of that. There is actually no hub in this box. That's the whole assembly. You've got obviously the cables for connecting all the, all the devices. So there are a few notable differences between Ryogen 2 and Ryogen 3. Uh, the first one is actually probably the biggest one. It's uh, the screen itself. So one of the main things that Asus has done with version 3 is provide extra storage on the cooler assembly for the screen itself. So you, they actually double the amount of storage. So you can have either higher quality animations or longer videos. Uh, which is a nice touch. Uh, one of the other things is they actually increased the thickness of the radiator, which increases the service area. It's only slightly, I believe it's only about three mil, uh, but still that's an important thing. They've also increased the inner diameter of these tubes by two millimeters, which reduces the flow resistance. Um, so we'll, we'll test the performance of that bit later on. Uh, and I wonder if the thickness increased is due to the fact that they're using these new fans. Um, which are quite well designed for this. I just wish that, you know, they made some changes to the fans for the connections. So you just go and like, I don't know, click them in or something without needing to screw everything together. But that does look a lot more clean. Right, let's try to set this up. So there are two sets of cables. And the reason there are two different cables is because one of them has a female connection, and the other one has male. And that's because it depends on your orientation, how you want to place your uh, fans. So technically speaking, you're going to connect this from either side. And the other end features the RGB header and fan header. So essentially, you just connect this straight into your motherboard and you're good to go. It's kind of ingenious. And then on the pump itself, we have two cables as well. We have the pump header. So this is the, just that you connect it to a pump header on your motherboard or a fan header, as well as a USB connection, which is going to be doing most of the controls. So a tip, pro tip here is push it towards itself, uh, pinch it, and it comes off. What you might want to do now is figure out how you're going to install these fans, if you want them in a push or pull configuration. So let me just see the fans themselves. So I like this. So when fans, on the, normally on the high-end fans, you actually have a little sign which way the uh, air goes. So you actually manage it that way. So if you don't know, normally the air is pushing towards the back of the fan, but some fans do have it inverted. 
Um, it's unlikely, but here you, at least you can see that it has a little arrow for the flow and then arrow towards which way you should actually have it pointing. This going inside the case, you will probably mount it. You ideally want to mount this probably at the front or at the top and you're probably going to stick it on a CPU like this. So therefore, you, what you want to do is have it in a pull configuration. Therefore, any dust that accumulates on this side could be easily maintained and just cleaned off uh, on later stages. If you do mount it on top, here it doesn't really matter as much. Uh, what you can actually do is still, you can actually mount the fans up top, pushing the air out. So any dust, dust collector you can still clean from the bottom, um, but here it's gonna be a lot less particular perspective of anything crawling in because you'll be just pushing things out. In our configuration, what we'll do, we'll mount the fans up top here and we'll have them pull the air out through the radiator itself. With the fans screwed in, uh, and I've put in all the screws in, um, it looks very, very clean. Uh, one thing I noticed is actually there's a little bit of a gap in between the fans and the radiator. So it doesn't quite seal and it looks like it's a design feature uh, to give it more of that, uh, you know, edgy look. But it looks quite nice. And uh, next step is basically take off this inner plate. So same way as before, start taking off from one side and just push it towards the middle, it comes out. And then depending on how you mount the fans, you take the connector over here and you just let it mount itself. You might need to wiggle it in. So in, on this side, the connector actually has a little male port. So when you attach it, it actually lines up nicely. I've mounted it here because I actually want to route the cables together with the pipes and then you can just route it into the motherboard, whatever it is. So this actually looks quite clean. We'll do the same for the 240 mil radiator and we'll go and start testing them so we can actually check out uh, how they perform. Before we tackle the testing results, let's cover a few observations. Installing the cooler was pretty standard, just follow the provided manual. In our case, we're using the AM5 platform with Ryzen 7700X, which loves to get hot under full load. The water block does come with pre-applied thermal paste and yet another cover, making it convenient and protecting new builders from getting thermal compound everywhere. Before fully cable managing the cooler, it's beneficial to first arrange the fan cables during the initial trial. This should be done post installation, providing there's enough room. Despite the magnets being sturdy, there's still a risk of cable being dislodged during the cable management process. Therefore, avoid applying excessive force on the cable during the setup. I do like the fact that the cable ends up with a more standard fan and RGB connections rather than using something proprietary. I wonder if Asus will be interested in joining the Wendell and Gamers Nexus Open Pleb project to keep things in a particular standard between different manufacturers. The block of a cooler has the flexibility to be installed either horizontally or vertically. This facility is beneficial for the unconventional cases where an aesthetically pleasing screen orientation is desired. However, Asus does suggest positioning the pipes either above or below for the optimal performance. Regarding the screen, although it's nice to have real-time temperature and frequency readings, their continuous fluctuations don't provide a comprehensive understanding of the system status. A separate tracking tool that logs data over time might offer more utility. On a different note, the display could be used to enhance the aesthetic of the build, perhaps by using a GIF or a video that aligns with the overall design. Just like physical mounting can be done in two ways, you can also change the orientation of the screen in a software should you desire. In terms of fan control, the system is not as intuitive as I'd like. With Asus Motherboard, there's a division in the settings where the motherboard fans are managed by the motherboard itself. In contrast, the pump and a VRM fan settings are controlled via a separate menu, where the display is also managed. This segregation of control settings seems overly complex and unnecessary. Let's now jump into some performance testing, and here we've included a 360ml liquid cooler, Asus Strix LC version 2 for comparison. It is a high-end cooler, just without the screen. The AMD 7700X CPU does need a great cooler to get the most out of it. We've carried out a few tests, but we'll focus on the ones that are most important for end users, starting with just doing a quick drag race between all three of these coolers, where we set all fans as well as pump to 100%. In this test, the larger Ryzen 3 cooler is leading, while the ROG Strix LC is performing the worst. The difference of 5 degrees is actually significant. 
What is interesting that 240ml version is also outperforming the Strix. You can also see here that we have two options with Vero fans set to 50%. This is due to the fact that this small fan is known to be the loudest component in the system. I was curious to see if reducing the speed would have any noticeable effect, and interestingly, there was a minimal difference. It was observed that 240ml coolers seemed to perform better with fan speed reduced. However, this is actually attributed to the CPU lowering its boost frequency. Temperature by itself is not a good parameter. As I've mentioned earlier, the VRM fan is actually rather loud. While everything is at 100%, the coolers are actually similarly loud at around 50 to 51 dBA. Turning down the VRM fan reduces that noise significantly. Also due to its size, the pitch of the noise is rather annoying and I'm really happy to be able to turn it down. For a fair consistent comparison, we've also tested with the fan speeds noise normalized to 40 dBA and we yet again see 240ml cooler performing the best with about 58 degrees delta above ambience, so let's dig a little bit deeper. When we check out the frequency over time, all three of these coolers look very similar and it's really hard to see a winner. But when we zoom in, there are three distinctive frequencies. The Strix cooler is around 50 to 80 MHz slower than the Ryzen 3 360mm cooler and the 240mm is somewhere in between. The difference isn't huge, but you can actually get more performance from these coolers, which is a nice touch. The next question is the VRM fan and its performance. This is actually a bit of a funny one. While the VRM on the motherboards gets hot, especially when you're using higher end chips and overclocking them, those motherboards normally have very beefy VRM heatsinks. Also, high end boards normally use overkill VRM, which can operate at high temperatures without any problems. We've set up a separate test using the 240ml cooler and checked the VRM temperature as reported by the ASUS ProArt board. At different fan speeds, there is some variance in the max temperature, but it's not huge and all of them are miles below max operating temperature. Take for example, ASUS Tough Gaming B550M Plus Wi-Fi. It's a mid-range board and it's using these VRM from Vishai. You can see from the data sheets that the max operating junction temperature is 150 degrees Celsius. The place where you might want to add extra VRM cooling is probably on the lower end boards, but then it would be a bit weird to purchase a three to $400 cooler for a sub $200 motherboard, which leads us well to the conclusion. Asus Ryzen 3 is certainly a high end cooler with pretty good performance. But the main selling point here is of course the three and a half inch screen, which is a gimmick for some, but a cherry on top for others who want to make a super personal build. I do like the improvements that Asus did over the Gen 2, like the single cable connection, which is using magnets. I hope they fix the software issues with the fan controls and make it all work in a single menu. Other than that, it is a cool product for those who can afford it. What do you guys think? Let us know in the comments below. We hope you found this review helpful. If you did, don't forget to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe for more content like this. We'll see you in the next one.